So basically for the rest of the semester, we're going to talk about hydraulic fracturing. And, and you know, after the day, we're going to get into the mechanics and models of hydraulic fracturing. Uh, but today is just sort of an overview um, uh, about why it's important, its impact, its environmental impact, a little bit about how it's done. I mean, you probably know a lot of this. You guys are all essentially young enough that you choose your college major after the shale revolution, right? So, I mean, it, it's likely that maybe you were influenced by this and what's going on. Um, you know, can a, any of you say that you sort of, as a high school student, noticed all the activity in hydraulic fracturing and, and that's what interests you and what made you want to become a petroleum engineer? Um, have any of you had internships where you, I know it's a little, a little harder to get now, but I mean, have you, have you been lucky enough to get one? Well, just in, I mean, have you got an internship and or okay? You worked on a, did you work on a frag job at all? Uh, yeah, I did. Okay. So, uh, you know, so I, I like to start this overview and, and talk about the impact and other things because, as representatives of this department and representatives of petroleum engineering, I think it's good to be informed in sort of the big picture, big, big, big picture sense, right? Uh, as opposed to, you know, we'll, we'll have plenty of time to get into the technical details soon, right? So, <clears throat> and you know, you probably know some of this, but maybe you don't. This is one of my favorite pictures. It was taken a few years ago. From, it's obviously a satellite photo of the United States taken at night. Again, it was taken a few years ago. It'd probably look a little different now. But, you know, just sort of to get an idea of what we're looking at, I guess for the sake of the video, I'll draw on the screen. Um, you know, this is Houston here. This is Dallas. This is Austin, San Antonio. What is this right here? Why are all those lights that rival the lights of Houston and Dallas and Austin and San Antonio in the middle of nowhere? What is that? That's the Eagle Ford Shell, right? You can almost draw a circle around that, those lights, and that's exactly the geography of the Eagle Ford Shell, right? <coughs> So here's, uh, here's Chicago. What is this? That happens to be in North Dakota. Why are there lights that rival the brightness of Chicago in North Dakota? Maybe the Bakken? It's the Bakken. And of course, if you know what you're looking for, uh, there's some, some seemingly too many lights in the Permian Basin, right? And a little harder to distinguish the, the Marcellus over here in Pennsylvania, uh, in New York, because of all the other lights on the East Coast. But, you know, these are shell plays, active shell plays. Those lights are due to some, some significant amount is gas flaring, but also, a lot of just there's just a lot of lights on the rigs, <coughs> and if you would have driven into the Eagle Ford two years ago at night, uh, like say if you drive down from, um, uh, I think, what is the road there? One is it 183 that goes from Luling down to Gonzales and down that way. If you were to drive down that road at night, it was like daylight out there because of all the lights. Of course, then you can see it from space. So the point is, this is just a sort of uh, fun way to get a picture of the amount of activity that was occurring two years ago. Now, because the price drop, some of that slowed down, right? In terms of active drilling, right? I mean, there's still, all these wells are still in production for the most part. Mm. 
So here's another way to look at the same thing. This is the total U.S. oil production from, I think, 1922 until last year when I took this chart. Um, I actually looked at it this morning, and I could probably complete the, I thought about replacing it, but it wasn't significantly different. It's sort of like that. So it did reach uh, 300 million barrels, uh, and then it's dropped off a little bit okay, in the last year. So about 1970, we reached the peak, and we started to decline. And then there was a sort of aberration in the mid-70s, early 80s. Anybody know what that is? The what? No, no. This is oil production, right? So it's, it's Alaska, Prudhoe Bay field, specifically. Uh, and so there was a little turnaround, and then basically a steady decline until about 2008, when George Mitchell uh, basically perfected slick water hydraulic fracking. And here we go, turn it around. Okay. You, you were you were talking. I think you're th you're thinking the, the the OPEC oil embargo. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, you know, so that that occurred in the late 70s. Yeah. So here's 1980. So yeah, it, it I mean it was falling off because of just the lack of new production, lack of new fields, right? And and you know so you know. No, it boosted again because we discovered Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, which is this major major find. And we, we not just discovered it, it, we brought it into production. Yeah. Brought it into production. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's right there. Uh, it, 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 it touched this line, which is roughly the peak. There's no question without the price drop we would have. Right? So, so now the decline is more has to do with prices than because we have the technology to produce. You know, and during this whole cycle, you know, I mean, this this department is famous for EOR, right? Enhanced oil recovery, it's the best people in the world, and all during this time, the advancements in EOR were occurring. Nothing turned it around. So we're getting more and more out of existing fields, but nothing turned. You know, nothing turned it around. This had to do with the technology of horizontal drilling, sick water fracturing, and, and shale, right? And there's plenty more shale. So if the price environment's right, there's no question it could drive, you know. So here, um, you know, it, it's really a supply. This, this turnaround is really due to supply and demand uh, in the sense of that, you know, we've been able to produce efficiently, cheaply, a lot, very quickly, right? and we could easily drive that up higher. Um, <clears throat> I'm a native Texan. How many of you are native Texans? Or, you know, if you weren't born here, you, you spent enough time here, you call Texas your home state. Okay, so it's maybe something to be proud of. So this is the. This is the six top oil producing states. That's Texas, California, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Alaska, and New Mexico. Which one do you think is Texas? That's the blue one. And of course, uh, you know, so, so uh, we exceed everyone else by a long ways. Right? And, uh, and of course, uh, you know, even if you're not a native Texan, you, if you're going to work in this industry, it's very likely you're going to become a native Texan, right? I mean, you're going to spend time in your life in Texas, uh, likely Houston. But I think it would be very rare for someone to have an entire career in the oil industry and not spend a little bit of time in, the, in residence in Texas. So, uh, you know, I guess something to be proud of for your, your home state or temporary home state. So if you look at the production by clay, the Eagle Ford, right? 
Man, Eagle Ford is easily the play I know the most about. Um, I got involved in patrolling engineering essentially because of the Eagle Ford Shale when I was living in San Antonio. Uh, I, I thought I lived too close to the Eagle Ford Shale not to be involved. And I uh, started working on hydraulic fracturing problems related to the Eagle Ford Shale. So the Eagle Ford Shale is the largest shale play in these are U.S. shell plays, but they're easily the largest also in the world um, in terms of production. So there's a lot of production. Um, the Bakken is in North Dakota, be second. And then all these others, are the Sprayberry, uh, Bone Spring, Wolf Camp, these are all in the Permian Basin. Okay? Not really shell plays. Um, so this is just, this is just uh, oil production. Uh, so the, the Permian Basin is not really a shell play, but they're using the same technology in that play um, to extract more oil, hydraulic fracturing, horizontal drilling. Uh, so the Eagle Ford is a big deal, and uh, you know you can drive down there. It's a couple hours from here. Um, there's, if you don't know where the Eagle Ford is. It's, it's sort of in this region of Texas. There's San Antonio, there's Austin. Um, th there are, there are play places, all this sort of black area is the Austin Chalk, which is a sort of a part of the Eagle Ford Shell. And these are, are black areas that are outcroppings that you can see at the surface. And so that's sort of right around where we live. Anyway, uh, the Eagle Ford c encompasses about 22 counties in South Texas. It runs from, you know, Houston's over here, so sort of in this sort of crescent shape from Houston to San, below San Antonio. And it's very much a play where, where uh, the green area there is, is oil rich and the sort of tawny color, whatever the color that is, uh, uh, is condensate and in the south part is gas, okay, dry gas. So. One of the reasons that the Eagle Ford is so popular is because it is oil rich. And, you know, now we have also low oil prices, but we've also, for, ten, you know, for since 2008, for 10 years, have had quite low gas prices. So there wasn't a lot of gas production being done in the Eagle Ford because of the low gas prices. Uh, so this is a quite, quite an old plot. This, those red dots are dr wells. Uh, I think if you, if you see it now, it would be far more dense. Uh, the red dots are, are condensate wells, the green dots are oil wells. And uh, I think if you looked at it now, it would be far, far more dense uh, in the green area. Um, of course, we all know that the Eagle Ford Shale stops right at the Rio Grande. The Rio Grande cuts it off, right? Why are you shaking your head? That's a joke. <laughs> of course it doesn't. It, it extends into Mexico. Um, if you look, go back and you look at that satellite picture, I mean, the operations stop at the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. I mean, uh, at, at, the, at the Rio Grande. Okay. Um, but I think the Mexican government, the Eagle Ford Shale, in fact, <laughs> continues into Mexico. And uh, I think the Mexican government is very interested in, in changing that, that uh, bringing that, that area into production. Uh, you know, from a national security perspective, uh, then, you know, people make the argument that our dependence on foreign oil makes us less safe. So, you know, in last year we surpassed the Saudi Arabia in terms of oil production. We surpassed Russia in terms of gas production in, in the United States. Again, due to the technology, hydraulic fracturing, and horizontal drilling, and shale. Um, If we look forward, and this is, you know, all this data is from the uh, Energy Information Association. So this is DOE data. I, I took all these plots right off the DOE's website. Um, so if you look out you know, into the future, to 2040, this is where the share of energy needs is going to come from, your energy use, right? This is where energy use. And so, I mean, if you, if you talk about renewables and biofuels and batteries and wind and solar and you know, there's a whole building from in the mechanical engineering over there of people doing research in these areas. And even looking out to 2040, it's going to make up you know, 10, 10% of our total energy use, right? e even with some optimism looking forward. So the vast majority, 
now and looking forward for another 20 plus years is going to come from petroleum, now natural gas, and that share is going to increase. We're, in, we're converting our coal power plants to natural gas power plants. You know, I, I would hope we could convert some cars. I actually, I drive a diesel truck, and a few years ago, I, I looked at converting my diesel pickup to CNG, uh, compressed natural gas, because um, the, the kit's about three grand to do it, uh, and you can get about 100 miles to the CNG gallon if you run on CNG. Uh, you do have to inject a little diesel, uh, so you, you would also use some diesel, but th the point is the efficiencies are way up. Uh, the problem is there's no infrastructure. I couldn't get CNG in San Antonio. Uh, I think there was one consumer gas station or CNG station I could fill up at. Um, uh, you know, it, was, it was sort of on the other side of town. It was, it was <laughs> very inconvenient to go to that one. Uh, make sure. That, you know. So we need some infrastructure improvements so we can convert our cars. I think if you live in Oklahoma City or work in Oklahoma City, I think there's about 30 or 40 consumer CNG filling stations in Oklahoma City. Um, of course, there's lots of fleet services, buses, and other things run on LNG or CNG, but the typical consumer can't go and fill up at those places. Uh, so just you know, the point here is looking out to the future. Oil and gas is here to stay in terms of our needs. Uh, most of what we talk about is oil, but uh, when you talk about where, uh, you know, if you look at where the gas is going to come from, uh, you can see shale gas is growing. Right? Um, so versus the sort of historical conventional places that we got gas from. What is shale? I think you probably know this. Right? You've all had petrophysics, I guess, and it's certainly too important to not know what it is. It's a organic rich mud rock. Um, and it's characterized by its low permeability, right? So out here you have conventional reservoirs that are on the you know 10 to 1,000 uh, millidarcy. So this is these are Middle East reservoirs where you just essentially go and stick your finger in the ground and pull it out and the oil flows out, right? <laughs> um, shell is not like that. Uh, so shell is down here in the very lowest range of this scale in the nano darcy region. And um, you have to do something to stimulate it to be able to produce from shale. And 